Hey toy family, welcome to the Marsham Toy Hour, where we discuss anything and everything designer toys. I'm Gary Ham. I'm Teresa Hawkins. I'm George Gaspar. Guys, congratulations. This is episode 150. Can you believe it? That's an amazing feat. Congratulations, Gary. <laughs> it's not me. This is a team effort. You all played a role. You might not have been I've... on 150 episodes, but you're integral to this this podcast. I've been on like 20. It's not nowhere near 150. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I actually don't even know. I kind of want to go back and add up my number. I'll have to do that. But you've been on for all of them. Mm-hmm. Lucky so... me. Lucky me. It's your milestone, Gary. Okay. Congrats. Well, to celebrate to celebrate my <laughs> monstrous number of 150, I thought we would uh, have a big guest join us today. So he is the master of monstrosities. He's a world-renowned Zafubi artist. He's the owner and operator of Mutant Vinyl Hardcore and Death's Vault Gallery. So let's just go ahead and welcome, I guess, Mutant Vinyl Hardcore to the show. Welcome. Hey, guys. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and we're going to call you Rich for the rest of the show, right? Please, yes. Okay. Do you want people to know your full name? Uh, I think by now most people do, but uh, if they don't, it's Rich Montaneri Jr. Okay. Um, yeah, just call me Rich. That's cool. Cool. Thanks for joining, man. I know a lot of our listeners were pretty excited to hear that you're you're finally joining. <laughs> yeah, a few people uh, were pretty stoked and asked me a lot of questions uh, through DMs and everything. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's was, it was pretty big honor. So, thanks for having me. Yeah, we have some listener questions for you. Some people reached out today through DM and in comments, so we have some questions from listeners. But before we get doing that, let's just get to know you a little bit, I guess. I don't know your whole history, your story. So one thing I like to know about artists is a lot of us discover the toy life late in, late in our careers, late in our life. So what were you right. doing before you started toys, and then how did you discover toys? Um, I, I, I've always been interested in toys you know it was just never one of those things that ever went away since childhood it just it just changed you go through your phases but i mean it's i just i've always been around that you know, I, I collected and worked all kinds of different jobs went to art school and you know one thing kind of just led to another and, and here i am doing it full-time you've been doing it full-time for a while now too right well no not really i mean i yeah i've definitely been around for about 13 years doing somewhat form of toy art but I didn't go full time till about maybe four years ago. Okay. So I mean, even even as far as like toy artists doing a full time standards goes, that is a pretty long time. But as an art career, yeah, I still think I'm pretty early on in my career. Did you go yeah. full time when you started the Death Vault Gallery? Is that around the same time, or did that come a little bit later? That came a little bit later, actually. Yeah. So I uh, I was working as driving a truck, actually. I mean, and I was just you know. I was always doing the, the art one way or the other, and it was do my day job to come home and do art and just kept on doing that. You know, and year on and year on going, and, and it, the, the art thing just kept on picking up more steam, kept on growing the fan base, and it got to the point where I was just like, all right, well, I'm actually doing better as an artist than I am with the day job. So it just kind of was one of those situations where it was like, I got to make a choice. My son was just born almost a year old at the time, and I was just like, all right, F it, let's just give it a shot, right? So I quit my day job and pursued the toy thing full time. And it's been like a, a pretty big roller coaster of, of a learning process and how to take care of a family, uh, take care of all the business side of things, and also still try to grow as an artist. Right. No, that's yeah. a scary time. The first year that your son's born, and then you're kind of, yeah. you know, as a new parent, you're kind of struggling with the idea of, shit, this isn't just about me anymore. I got to support right. others and, and all that sort of stuff. For you to want to go off onto your own and explore this art side of, of, of your career full time when your son was only one. Yeah. That's I commend you for doing that. That's not no easy thing to do. Yeah, it was scary and then you know, to be quite honest with you, to make matters even harder, it was that I got really sick with a stomach condition about the same time. So <sighs> I, I went full time as an artist and then within months to almost a year later I, I got the stomach condition and it was just like, all right, now what am I gonna do? It was just a very, very stressful time. No kidding. And I know a lot of people, yeah. when they go off on their own first, uh, full-time, sometimes, especially artists, they don't get that health insurance. No. That, well, that, you know, thank God for, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act. It was it came along right at the right time where we qualify for the, you know, for benefits. So nice. I was able to, yeah, so I was able to, you know, take care of the, everything properly and actually have health insurance. 
So, I mean, it worked out great for me. But, yeah, yeah man, it was it's, – it's one of those things you don't really think about because, you know, you're, you're really focused on the art. And then, you know, you're, you once you, like, you know, like, all right, I'm going to do this full time now. And you, you go off and do it full time. Then you're like, oh, yeah, we got to do taxes and we got to yep. do – health insurance and we got to do all these things and it's like oh yeah we got to make a paycheck every single month and it's just, <laughs> it just becomes all these little things you're like oh yeah that we'll figure that out as we go and you know you don't realize all these things you're, you don't plan for right now where are you living now you're in connecticut yeah well okay. yeah i'm in the the new haven county so yeah um i i've born and raised in connecticut and same uh live in new haven right now i'm about a town over from new haven it's a little bit of a nicer town Sket, uh, I think Sket One used to be from Connecticut. Yeah, it's funny that he was kind of like the first kind of like larger toy art, art artist that I, I met. And it just happened to be like he was like in the same town. And uh, he was really cool with me and, you know, helped me get into a little a show at a, a skate shop we had here in our town. Which it's not here anymore, but it was uh, Channel One. So it kind of helped me get me into like the skate deck show where he let me you know paint that and then with the dunnies and all that so so he was he was there in the very beginning of like kind of staring me in some direction how did you guys run into each other like just around town though i don't know did you guys meet each other at like art shows or how that happened i i don't really remember 100 percent, but we had some mutual friends and just from being in the town it was like one dude was like hey you know this 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 guy you know and he does these things that you're into and and then and that's when i like you know got introduced to him and we kind of just went from there i mean like i don't i don't haven't talked to the guy in many years but like i, I still have tons of respect for him I and mean, i do see him at like a decon i'll stop by and say hi but it's been a while what a small world i, I heard people say stories about you know meeting huck when he was a manager at kid robot store and then here you're saying that scott pretty much got you into your first art show and everything that's yeah. such, such a small world it really is i mean I, I think i think it's always been like that i mean like especially with like this style of art it's definitely a, a small world for sure you said you did dunnies yeah. at the beginning yeah definitely really i yeah. had no idea you did custom like when i think mutant vital hardcore i just think of i guess the current stuff i had no idea what? years ago you were customizing dunnies well, I mean, was like, it in I, the same style? So, uh, sort of. I mean, like I was, you know, I was, I was just more like I, this. I think I this. There's definitely two out there. I mean, I always wonder where they where they ended up. I mean, I was just more, you know, I was painting like just these really stylized eyes on them and really simple things. But yeah, man, I I started out collecting like dunnies and you know all kinds of kid robot toys and it just transitioned, you know, like. It's kind of like like when you get into like music or stuff, you might come across that one pop song or whatever it is, and then you start going down this rabbit hole of like the the refined versions or the more concentrated thing, and you're like you keep on going down and deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to that one thing that really grips you, and that's that's where I ended up with Safubi. Yeah, I don't know if it holds true today, but Kid Robot and the Dunny was most people's you know gateway into toys back in the day. Well, I think I think it's a great little platform, you know. I mean, like I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna disrespect it and like there was a definitely a time when i was like yeah I, I had that complete change of heart and i was definitely shitting on them but like you know you kind of come full circle to come back like yeah you know what man they, they have their place yeah definitely and the um they definitely deserve the respect that for the time that they changed the game for for a lot of artists oh for sure so was your focus in the scene at first more as a collector and less as an artist and a customizer and a toy creator it was it was it's weird because again I, I would just collect like I, I collect all like McFarland toys I, He-Man toys you name it I just I just like toys and uh, when I got in, you know to, to like the Dunnies and stuff it was I would just collect that it it didn't really come to like me like being like the the painter until like I got into this Afubi thing and that's when things kind of took off because I would you know I I would see the toy I I would have and kind of like oh it would look kind of cool in this colorway and. Uh, it wasn't done. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just paint it for myself. And I would paint things for my own collection. And people would reach out. I'm like, hey, man, would you mind painting one for me? I'm like, yeah, no problem. And, you know, that just kept on going down a rabbit hole, which we can talk about. But, yeah. So, I mean, like, it, 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 it wasn't ever, like, the, the whole, like, this was the game plan. It was just, I, I just wanted to keep doing what I was doing. So I, I had to do this. Well, evolve, I should say. Right. A lot of people start out that way. And when they get into toys as a collector, then they slowly evolve into customs or doing shows, especially the artist side of it. And then eventually, you, it seems like you had a strong desire to then take 
your knowledge in, in art and art school and all that to then build mutant vinyl hardcore. So at one point of your career, so you, how long did you collect before you decided, hey, screw this, I'm going to try my, make my own designs work? Man, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, maybe a couple of years, but it was, it was, it was more along the lines of respect. So I was, you know, like I was a huge fan of a brand called Realhead, right? So what happened was like I was at Toy Tokyo one day, just toy shopping, and I came across Bounty Hunter, and I just fell in love with Bounty Hunter. And then from Bounty Hunter, I came across, you know, Secret Base, and then Secret Base to Realhead, and for a while, I was just that was the brand. I was just really into Realhead, and I I had a toy blog and everything, and that's. The toy blog was named Mutant Vinyl Hardcore. That's where the title of my, my company came from. So I, I, I had a whole you know, blog dedicated to just Realhead. And uh, I, w- I would get, like, sometimes I, we, we would do, like, larger size runs, and I was painting them. And the word got back to Mori in Japan, and he wasn't very happy with it because, you know, I was taking his toys that he painted, and I was acetoning them and repainting them, and it was just... Like, hey, man, that's kind of disrespectful. And I was like, man, that's, you're right. That's, that's really kind of shady. And I, I didn't really, it didn't come across because I guess, I guess like the, the Dunny culture, we don't really, we didn't really think about that. It was just like that toy was a platform was there for that. And I kind of just, I put other toys in the same exact veins, like they're just platforms sometimes. Like I, I do collect because I'd have mess respect for it, but they're not really going to care. But when I finally like did care, I was just like, all right, man, I, I can't keep on painting this guy's toys. It's disrespectful, but I want to keep doing this. So the only way for me to do that is to make my own toys. So, you know, I had some designs and uh, I kind of tried to hire some sculptors and it didn't really work out. And I was just like, F it, man, let me, let me grab some clay and I'll try to give it a shot myself. So I, I hooked up with Ricky Wilson and he kind of did some, um, some, some started uh, the, the Ollie sculpt for me while I was trying some other stuff with clay. And I kind of just made my own designs and went from there so it was it was definitely like that that was like the whole process it was like i want to keep doing this i don't want to disrespect the guys that i highly admire so that was the that was the you know the step that's so interesting because i mean i know that like some toys will make diy versions right that are just like a single color or whether it's a single vinyl pull or whatever but i don't know i'm i'm curious if that's a like it feels like that's probably an artist by artist thing. Like oh, whether or not they take offense to you taking a toy that may have paint on it and customizing well, on top of it. I think I think it's even more so with like the indie makers because you know at the time like I, I had some kind of clue how things were made, but not too deep of clue. I didn't realize just how much money and time they invested into making these toys. You know, like you you don't you know you really don't think. But when you kind of like realize, oh, this is one guy, he paid for like the sculpts, he paid for the molds, and this is all on him. And I'm over here just taking his hard work and then just blasting over it and then selling it for myself. You know, it was just like, oh, well, that's, I wouldn't want somebody doing that to me. And that, that, so I think when it comes to like larger brand stuff, people really don't care. But like when it comes down to like the indie makers and people know that how much they put into this, that's when people have a little bit more respect for it, I think. Gary, would that bug you if you did like a, a run of like, I don't know, or a whoop? Like, would it bug you if someone took one of your whoopers and customized it? No, not at all. But that's a completely different scenario. I didn't hand paint any of the whoopers. All I did was the call outs and send them to a factory and they painted them. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not personally invested or that paint was not done by my hand. And there's no none of my spirit in that paint. You know, it's it's just mass produced on that level. I think what Rich is talking about is when people do this themselves. They're putting themselves in the paint, and they're, there's only a few of them out there. It's just right. it's, it's so different. If someone was to take my wood stuff and strip that down and uh, repaint it, yeah, I would be bummed because there's only so few out in the in the world that were that piece. And to think that someone stripped it down or they didn't like my work enough that they felt the need to strip it down to do something else with it, that would initially bum me out. And then I would probably think, well, I might be disrespected, but at the same point, I would realize it's pretty much theirs to do with what they want at that point. They paid for it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, I think, I think there's like, there's, there's a few, few sides of that coin, right? I mean, like, yeah, they, they do pay for it and that is theirs, but you're also like, you want to respect your fans too. Like, you know, I want, you know, like I, I only make X amount of these and I know there's an X amount of people that really want this. And mm-hmm. 
I would want to make sure that they're taken care of. You know, if once they're taken care of and there's leftovers and people have it, then yeah, whatever. But I mean, like, I'm just looking out for the people that actually really want these things and that, you know, they're, those are the people I really want to make sure get taken care of. Yeah, that's a great point. So you mentioned that Maury felt disrespected that you stripped his stuff and painted it yourself. Yeah. Has it ever been reversed where you seen your stuff stripped down and painted it by, by someone else? No, actually, I, I can't say it's ever happened. I mean, I've had a lot of things happen, but that's not one of them. I mean, for the most part, people will, that's why like, I, I sell blanks. I mean, a, a lot of the, you know, the earlier days, and the earlier days is not even that long ago, maybe, you know, 10 years ago and now, but the stuff would be like, there were, they, a lot of makers didn't sell blanks. It was all painted. So like the, the odds of getting a blank was like, that was even more of a, a rarity than an actual painted toy. So people wouldn't even paint the blanks because those are even harder to come by. The, there really was, wasn't any of that. But nowadays, like, there's just so many blanks because, I mean, I have my own, you know, opinions on why people have so many blanks out there. But there's this, there's this, you have the option now. You can buy a blank. Before, you wouldn't. So you would have to buy something that was painted and strip it down to paint it because there was no other option. Now, I don't want to gloss yeah. over the fact that it seems like you were saying that you are a self-taught sculptor for the reason of producing yeah. toys. Is that the case? Yeah, it was crazy. I, I, I did go to art school. It wasn't for very long. I mean, like I, maybe for a year and a half, two years. When I went to art school, I was going for um, like fine art and illustration because that's what I thought I was going to get into. I mean, and like, you know, you, you don't really like you kind of go into like school or even any kind of plan of what you know. Like, oh, I, I, I know artists, man. I know tattooists. I know I know I have people that work for Marvel Comics and like I could see that path. But I didn't know a single sculptor. I didn't know any kind of toy designer. I didn't know any of that. So it was just out of necessity that I taught myself to sculpt. And I had one class in sculpture, but it wasn't anything. Uh, so when I, I needed the sculpt, I, I actually tried hiring somebody that I was led to. And this person took so long and got nothing done. I was just like, man, I, I can't keep waiting around. I mean, like, what's the worst case scenario? It was just, I, I can't do it. So I said, F it. Let me just grab a lump of clay because I know what these guys use. And I was like, I'll give it a shot. And it's just like, that was... I did one small resin head, and then the second thing I sculpted was the Sludge Demon, the the, the, the mini version. And that, <laughs> after I seen that, I was like, "Oh, I, I think I can do this." And <laughs> I just kept pushing forward with it. And yeah, I here We've I. We've heard that story several times, George. Is it? What do you think when people just can pick up sculpting and then just run with it so quickly? Is it? Is it a skill set? Is it a talent? Or is it just the desire to do it? Well, how is it that this seems to be achieved so easily? I wish I knew it didn't come to me that easy. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think there's a I difference think. too, when you're creating your own character and sculpting yeah. your thing and sculpting someone else's thing. Like, yeah, I, yeah, it's totally sure. sure. You, you can like, I don't know. I think it, not that it's easier to sculpt your own thing, but there's a, like you have the ability to like, whatever you make is the way it's supposed to look. You well, know, I think I, I think too is like you know what me personally I don't have like when I when I go to make a toy or some kind of sculpture I have something in my head but I don't draw it I kind of just grab the clay and start making it. This way you're not like I'm not married to any design. So if you're hired by somebody they're going to give you turnarounds this that, and the third. So you kind of have to stick to the the script as we're as an art and you're doing your own stuff. You can just make changes on the fly and be like that will work and nobody's going to tell you otherwise. Agreed. Okay. Has your style evolved over time, or have you always sculpted? Uh, yeah, I, I think pretty I, I definitely. It, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I, no, it definitely evolved. I mean, it, it started out like I try to like emulate, you know, again, real head, and then other makers like uh, Gargamel, and then I just kind of fell in love with a brand called Bimon, and uh, that changed the game for me with like textures and you know the way a sculpt can look. And after that, it was just. I kept on trying to refine my style. So I, I kept on like, you know, like want to put more detail and more layers and more textures. And it was, you know, between Bimon, Nag and all the other, you know, Japanese makers that were getting really highly detailed. It was just, that was like the path. I was like, oh yeah, that's where I want to go. And I just had to keep on trying to refine my, my sculpting abilities to get there. Is there a crudeness to your early pieces? Like I know Sludge Demon and Ollie, is, you've been doing that, your, those, those figures your entire career. I think you're still doing new releases yeah. of those when you look yeah. back at the ones you did in 2010 is there a difference in the skill set that you had or are they still stand up to your your standards oh there's definitely like you know uh, it's, it's, it's changed i mean 
I remember at the time, man, like if there's a lot of things like, like with hands and feet, especially it was just, they were the hardest. So I would, you know, with Ali, man, I, I couldn't really sculpt hands. So the, the club hand kind of came out of, uh, you know, I just couldn't do it. So it was like, I, I had that one hand and it was just like, all right, I'm going to try to mimic it. And I just couldn't get it to where I wanted it. And I was just like, well, I can't spend all this time trying to make the same thing. So I was like, what else can I do? And I was like, oh, no, a club hand would be kind of cool. So I kind of just started like molding that. I'm like, that actually looks even cooler. So I'm going with this. Or like his backbone, like I couldn't get it right. So I just made it all curved up and funky. I'm like, that'll work because it, it, it you know, you just kind of start like cutting the fat and not thinking too much on the details. And then, you know, over time I, I was, I'm able to now sculpt hands, sculpt feet and have them match perfectly. And it doesn't bother me. But since I, it kind of worked in the beginning, I don't have to be so stuck to it. I can either sculpt hands or I can just sculpt some kind of like crazy arm and it'll still work. Huh. I know uh, when we had Paul Kaiju on, he was saying that he would study like a lot of the Japanese toys and whatnot, and that's how he yeah. learned his limitations as to what he could and couldn't do, what he can sculpt yeah. for molding and all that. Did you go through that process as well? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think me and Paul kind of came up at the same exact time. I mean, he was definitely he's definitely ahead of me. I mean, he's he's been around like the toy game for much longer than me. He's an OG for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like I I kind of came up in the same exact you know like you you buy toys. And uh, talk to like the manufacturer, like 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 saying Ricky Wilson, and and you kind of they would kind of tell you like like uh, this has to be pulled for like you know through gravity. So when you sculpt this part, you got to make sure that it goes with the mold going downwards and not against it. So you would have to like sculpt every part, going all right. Well, this would how this would work, and this would how it wouldn't work. So you you had your limitations, and you try to manipulate the sculpt so it, it would work in its favor. And now you make two pieces that would be different molds that can kind of give the illusion that they're going against each other, but they're not. I mean, it's just interesting to me, like scrolling through like your feeds and stuff and looking at your sculpt work, you, mm. it's like you have kind of, you kind of can do a variety of different styles. Like I see yeah. stuff that's very smooth. I see stuff yeah. that's, I would say, I guess more like polished in the sense that it's very detailed, but it's like a polished sort of detail. And then there's kind of this in between where it's, I don't want to say mushy, detail but it's kind of more of a, r- a rough approach yeah well that's the thing it's, man like I, I for me i get i get bored pretty easily like right now like I, I probably have a good four or five sculpts started that are like some are on my workbench some are in the draw some are like you know they're just all over the place and the, this is one that i'm coming to a completion on within the next few months i started it probably six years ago and would just work on a little here work on a little there so you're getting a little bit of a timeline like i started it when i couldn't do one thing and then I'm going to be finishing it where I, I completely changed my sculpting style. So it has some evolution born into it. But I, I appreciate the challenge of trying to do stuff that's either polished or not polished or cute or not cute. Because like, I come from that kind of collecting base where like, I, I can appreciate everything. I'm going to give everything a shot. I really want to know how you accomplish this like rough detail. I don't know how to explain it. Like Some of them are... I don't like how are you applying some of these texture that almost make it look like rock, I guess, for lack of a better word. Like okay. it's bumpy, it's bumpy mm-hmm. and it's not polished. Are you how are you are you using something to achieve that? Yeah, I mean like it, you'll you'll find all kinds of stuff from crumpled up tin foil to kind of you know hemp sacks or whatever you can get your hands on that has some kind of texture to it. Just, you know, by working it into the clay, you can you can get some pretty cool stuff. And it just you you kind of like over time, you kind of have your little bag of tricks. And then like you have some things that you know how to come back to and manipulate that to look different. So a lot of time, like especially with the earlier stuff, yeah, it was just crumpling up tinfoil and just mashing it into the Sculpey and then just taking like a, a brush with some turpenoid and just smoothing that out and doing it over and over again. And that'll bake it, add more Sculpey, do the same thing in certain areas and do this. You would build up layers. Huh. Okay. Of all your bag of tricks, what do you feel oh. like is your most innovative or cool thing that you feel like other people out there would be like, oh, shit, that's awesome. I should do that, too. Or like, oh, my God, that's such a good idea. I never thought of that. And everyone will start doing it because it's the coolest t- tip and trick ever. I don't I don't think there's any specific one, to be honest with you. I mean... When I, I've, I sat here with other sculptors and everybody kind of has the same things, man. Like, it's just, I think what it really is, is just, you know, refinement. I mean, like so many people will throw in the towel way before it's finished. And if you just kept on working it 
you'll you'll you can get to a different level. Like I, I've seen so many toys that have so many tool marks. I'm like, man, if you just sat there with a little bit more turpenoid and a brush, or just kept going at it, you could have you could have smoothed that line out, or you could have added a few more lines that are just a little bit more subtle. You, you, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. This is the patience to keep working on something, even when you think it's done. You might want to put a little bit more work into it. Now, you mentioned that you developed a relationship with Ricky over uh, Velocitron over in Japan. How did that relationship yeah. come about? And are you are you solely dedicated to your at least your vinyl pieces? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I'll answer that the first. The, the, well, with Ricky, it was this you know it was through Skullbrain. I, I first went to the guys at Gargamel, and I just couldn't afford it. And uh, I was led to Ricky. You're like, listen, man, you can, you can, you know, there's this guy named Ricky. He's, he's doing his little thing out there. So I got in contact with Ricky and he's like, yeah, it's, you know, he gave me some prices and I was like, all right, that's actually doable. And I was doing the, the sledge demon, the, the first one I made, it was the two pieces, really simple design. And the, the cost for setup was pretty inexpensive. I mean, the thing is that this takes a little bit longer to get things done at the time it would take a good year for a turnaround. That that's how me and Ricky kind of got hooked up, and then you know we just built our relationship through that. I mean, you know, he's For those you know, not familiar. Didn't... Ricky is he's a Westerner who then moved to Japan. I think along with Luke Rook, they were both out there. So they were a uh, couple of the only Westerners that were living in yeah. Japan doing this think, sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I know I know Ricky's not doing it anymore. Yeah, and he's moved on to other things. But yeah, I, at the time that there, there was there was no other way into the factory because unless you were there. And then you had to build your relationship with the factory owners as well. You can't just like, if you couldn't just, even now, you couldn't just email Mariama and be like, hey, I want to make a toy. They, they're not going to reply to you. You've right. got to have like a, a friend of a friend that's getting in there. And then you build these relationships. And, you know, Ricky was my guy at the time. And, you know, I just kept working with him. And he's the one that, you know, got me through that. And what was, what was hey. that question for that? I'm sorry. I guess the second part of that question was, I know that you're really loyal and you're very into the oh, yeah. Japanese culture. Yeah, yeah. As far as all your vinyl pieces, would you prefer yeah. they all come out of Japan? I, at this point, I, I do solely because of quality control and the relationships I built. Being somebody that's, you know, has to put all my faith into a factory and the other side of the planet is just, it takes a lot, you know? Yeah. So you know, I, I'm not saying anything bad about the Chinese factories, and I see some really good stuff, especially with Unbox. They're they're making some really quality pieces, but I just don't have those connections to those factories where I feel comfortable yet. I mean, especially with having already having issues with blue legs in my toys, I want to make sure that everything I deal with is with somebody that I know is not going to like pull some for themselves when they're when nobody's looking or take something and just remake it in the factory without me knowing. So, aside from the quality control, it's it's just the you know having the trust in these relationships that I've built. So you've had, you've had people bootlegging your vinyl? Yeah. I mean, I have uh, this, this one specific Chinese bootlegger, but yeah, he's bootlegged the DX, the Ollie figure. He's also bootlegged Hirota stuff, you know, nags stuff and some real head toys. And yeah, definitely. I mean, like it was, it was a shock and it was just like, all right, like, how am I going to, what am I going to do now? I mean, you know, but I, th I think, in the long run, this has been yeah, kind of it kind of bit the guy in his own ass because you know now it's just people like they they want original art they don't want you know replications of something that he's charging more than I am sometimes. Jeez, man, how does if, how does that work? Did they they didn't like steal your mold and like pour into it? They like resculpted yeah, no. a big, big version. No, the the guy had. <laughs> He had the guts or the, the balls that come to my actual shop. Like, and I didn't know at the time he was a bootlegger, but he was buying actual toys and they would just recast them. So they wouldn't, you know, <gasps> yeah. So, like, I have photos of a guy in my shop and I'm like, oh my God, really? Yeah. No. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, you know, they, what they would do is he would just, you know, there, you, you can, you know, just cast from an actual toy. You don't have to have the molds. You can, you can do that. It just, you know, the toy is smaller. It'd be, it's, it's not super um, noticeable unless you, you, you know, you, you have an original. Then you can see the size difference is a little bit smaller, a little less uh, definition. But it's. But your it's fan beautiful. base is strong and loyal. Like they have to pick up on this stuff immediately, or no? Yeah, yeah. No, the, um, that was it. Was a fan that told me he was like, 
you're being bootlegged in China, and here's the here's here's photos, and here's a proof. And it was a Chinese collector of mine. And I was just I I, I was in disbelief. I was like, nah, that that looks like a, a, a crack. Somebody you know got a maybe a, a blank and just did a crappy paint job on it. And they were like, no, these are bootlegs. And they like, and then it was just <laughs> one thing led to the other. And it you know yeah, I got down to the actual guy that was actually doing it, and then he didn't deny it. And we got into some words. And I was like, oh, God, so this is the thing now. Yeah. It's something to be aware of when you become popular. And like I said, a lot of those, we haven't, I was going to get to this later in the show, but for those not familiar, like you and know, my hardcore stuff, it just sells out. It's just, you have to do lottery systems and stuff to earn this stuff. And a lot of the times I've heard new collectors who are picking up into your, into your stuff, yeah. they have a hard time getting it because of the lottery system. And then you're also very aware and wary of the secondary market. So, uh, yeah. It sounds like you might not trust the the newcomers as much because you want to ensure that the fans that have been loyal to you for years are you know able to get your pieces as well. So, but we can talk about that later. But that's that's something sure. a, a listener did bring up. Yeah, sure. You tell me. I can I can address it now if you like. Well, yeah. I guess let's since I asked this, let's go ahead and answer that question for the listener. So, how do you balance selling your toys to your your legion and loyal collectors while opening up the ability for new fans to own your work? It's, it's, it's definitely challenging, right? It all kind of stems back to like, all right, the the actual run size. I mean, like, I think the misconception people have is, oh, I can just make a hundred of them, right? Or I can make a thousand. Or they, they they don't realize that like the factory themselves are like one or two guys strong mm -hmm. and they only pull so much because, you know, it's not just me pulling orders. So if I get a run of say 35 or 50 of a toy, I have, that's it. And I'm not going to get any more. So I can't be like, Hey man, I'm going to make 150 of these and everybody's going to be happy. And then at the same exact time I have to, you know, I want to really focus on quality control. I mean, being an independent maker or that's what I really want to focus on making sure the quality is there from the paint standpoint. So those come down to how much I can actually make. And then, yeah, you go into the next step is like, all right, you have people that have supported me for the last 13 years. And there's no, you know, like I don't try to hide it. Yeah, there's definitely a, a, a handful of people that I'm going to make sure are getting taken care of because they're the ones that supported me. Right. But just like the, the newer collectors, yeah, I want to make sure they're taken care of too. So, I mean, I can only do my best to weed out flippers and I'm not going to spend my time being like this global police. I want to focus on the art. I don't want to focus on being like this guy. So I, I think the misconceptions people think I'm, I'm not selling to new people are hiding from me. It's just the, the fact that matters is there's more people than, than there are toys and the people that are actually winning, they're, they're not even saying they're winning because they don't want to get hit up for people asking them to sell. So there's a lot of new collectors that are getting it too. They just, they're just not saying it. Either for the fact that yeah, they're just they just don't want to be hit up, or they want to flip it themselves, and don't want people to know they actually had it. So that's the misconception. Like there's a lot of new collectors that are definitely getting these toys. They're just keeping it quiet, and I can okay. understand why now, especially with like the players and this and the third. They wanna they wanna enjoy their collection and not be bombarded with you know will you sell to me or any of that. Right. But, no. Yeah, it is for sure is a challenge, man. Like you know, like I the the older collectors I have or they don't always win. And they're cool with it and, you know, they, they get it and they want to, you know, they want to see, you know, somebody that they supported, you know, grow as well. And, you know, I, I try to make it fair for everybody. And that's when the lotteries come. I've tried doing, you know, web shop drops and those are even worse. Those would just, you know, they would crash because people would be like, you know, just trying to buy. And then I would get blamed for bots or something like that. It was always, right. there's, always there's always something. But yeah. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, no, man, it's, it's, it's as fair as I can get it. And there's definitely a lot of new people buying how long have you been doing the lottery system then? Are all your releases gone through lottery then? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in some way, shape, or form since the very beginning. Because, you know, in the very beginning, I was only making, like, maybe like, the run would be, like, a five-figure run. You know, like, and if you have, even if you have ten people, it's like, all right, man, i got to be fair to everybody. Yeah. And, it's, you know, it just the, the fan base grew, but, like, I can only grow so much as what I can actually produce. And I don't want to go any higher than a run of 50 because I just think the quality kind of goes to shit after that. Now, is everything you sell um, like a vinyl pole from Japan, or do you also sell just straight sculpts that you've done that you hand paint? Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, pretty much everything is vinyl from Japan. Okay. And are you painting all these yourself as well? Yeah, yeah. You do the whole shebang. You do the painting, the, whole... the packaging, 
you just handle yeah. every aspect of it. So you got 100% yeah. finger on the pulse of quality Little, control. Literally everything. I'm the one that does the paint, the package, the design. I pack the boxes. I ship the labels. I, I literally do everything. <laughs> Is this more co- okay? So, like, we had this exact same conversation with Retroband about that, and I remember I was just like, "No way!" I had no idea people hand paint vinyl poles. But is is it just a uh, maybe? It's just like kind of the way things work in the Sofubi side of things. Is it pretty common for a lot of you all to be getting the vinyl pole, but then applying all the paint on all your runs yourself? Is that just what that side of the scene is like for the majority? <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I think the vast majority is like that. And I think that's the reason why people appreciate it and are collecting it because it's just one more thing that's you, you have the artist that actually may have sculpted it. They're actually painting it and packaging it. So they're they're putting their all into it. They're not relying on another system to you know do a pad print or, you know, so that's why people are really drawn to this in the end because it's, it's the, you know, you're really getting the right from the artist's hands, the artwork themselves. So I know like as part of, you know, Japanese vinyl that there's the ability to get masks made. And I know a lot of times those are those are more things that the actual person pulling might use to paint and they might paint the mask. But do you have masks yourself made that you can utilize to speed up your process? Uh, Yeah, yeah. Right now, the the toy, the, the little guy, Bernie. I have a spray mask for his eyes and the, the astronaut, like the mechs I have, the DC-13 figure, I just got spray masks for those. But the thing is, like, even with spray masks, it still takes time because it's not like you just clamp it on, spray, and move on. I mean, like, the vinyl has to be heated up before you can even put it on so it can stay in place. So it's still a, a massive process. It just makes the lines cleaner and it does speed it up somewhat. I mean, especially with, like, eyes where you have these very fine lines and those would be super duper hard to, you know, paint every time. So that does speed up the process, but it still takes a long time, even with masks. Oh, for sure. But that's intriguing. Yeah. I mean, so you could technically, Gary, have someone pull whoopers, give you your masks, and you could be hand painting all those. You need to step up your game. Yeah. You need to- no, <laughs> this painting is one part of the process that I've never truly enjoyed, which is another you reason gotta- I don't do that many customs. I just don't enjoy painting that much. You got to fit in with the Sofubi crowd. You got to be following what they do. No, so they're better they're- than me. I'll admit they're better. It's okay. Well, I, I like my I- spot. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's not for everybody, and it's I I think it's just my OCD that makes me go I I need to do this. It's not I mean, if that's the biggest thing is like I very controlling. I I have to do this. How does it work with collaborations though? You've worked you've done collaborations with Splurt, Realhead, Skinner, Paul Kaiju. Like when you guys yeah. collaborate together, how do who how do you decide who does the paintwork on the collaborations? Oh, uh, usually it's I mean like it's just like say like we pull. 50 figures right they get 25 i get 25 and it's like have at it do what you got to do like i don't think i think that's the thing when we when we can't we start to start working with people you have to you put your trust in them and you don't you know i'm not going to sit there and tell them what to do like they wouldn't tell me what to do so it's like we trust each other you're an artist you do good just do your thing when it comes to like sculpture work we might have a conversation of like all right this fits better here this works better there this kind of works overall but in the grand scheme of things it's it's as hands-off as possible this way like you can do what they do best and it's not like i'm here to tell them how to do their job you know right no that's cool now sometimes well most of the time the stuff is hand sculpted by yourself but on occasion they are have been digitally rendered by uh by others so when yeah. it's done by others through a digital medium do you notice like a difference in this the spirit or the essence of your designs when it's hand sculpted versus digitally done no, uh, I think I think hand sculpt is the is definitely was going to be the king. I mean, it's just there's nothing like knowing that somebody actually grabbed the clay, grabbed the tools, and made it happen. Um, like, but the thing with digital is like sometimes it's great when it's like, especially like you have somebody collaborating, like me and Skinner, we did Crawlis. It was just like, all right, we're he's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast, and we had like, how are we going to do this? And we hired a, a digital guy and uh, well, Scott from Shimbone, and he just he nailed it. And uh, that was definitely early on, too, in the digital phase. It was a little bit more softer. We couldn't get as much detail. It's changed a lot since then. But, I mean, I'm up for all of it. I mean, I think it's just another tool. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, poo-poo on anything. I mean, it's just another, you know, way of approaching something. I mean, if if you can, if you want to work in digital, then have at it. Just do the best you can do. If you want to work in traditional, you know, clay and tools, have at it. I mean, that's what I, that's my medium. That's what I'm. I'm happy with that's what I fell in love with so that's what I'm going to stick to but I mean as far as digital man I don't have any 
problems with it. Yeah. Now, when you're working with a digital sculptor, you have to play the role of art director and look at the stuff. Are yeah. you trying to get them to sculpt and make it look as hand done as possible? Because I know with di digital printing, a lot of the times things tend to look a little uh, smooth and more rounded. And they also have the advantage yeah. of mirroring and, and symmetry. And that's probably something that you don't want in your work. So I imagine you have to try to steer them away from that, that digital appearance that you can sometimes get. It depends. I mean, when I when I did the the last figure with Metacom, no, I wanted it to be you know as clean as possible. But with Krullis, it was like, yeah, we need to have some imperfections, and that's the thing, man. Like you know, when it comes to imperfections, there's, there's nothing better than your own hands because you're gonna make that mistake no matter what, just because that's the nature of the beast. But no, man, it it it's, it just it really depends. You know, uh, it depends on the 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 sculpt and the the concept of it. Now, okay, so we've talked a lot about your work and, and kind of the, the various styles, but is there uh, any kind of inspiration behind it? Or is it just like monsters and creatures in your head? Like, is, well, is there a world you're building or a world it's based off of, or it's just kind of whatever you think is cool, you just make it happen? Yeah, real cool, for sure. I mean, I, I grew up I grew up on, you know, you know, fantasy and barbarian movies and all, all those kind of things. And then just you know, between like that horror movies and then you get into like anime and it's just, you, you kind of just do, you don't have to like really go by any rules. And there's definitely like, you know, you start building a little universe and it's like, all right, I can get, you know, kind of boxed into this. So I'm just going to make whatever, whatever my mind wants to make. And then I just make it, you know, at, at first it was a little more like, all right, I'm going to stay with more like the Japanese, the yokai monster kind of grab. And then, then I was like, well, I kind of want to make, you know, like, these mechs and astronauts and like i don't want to just be stuck making that so you just gotta sort of at one point you gotta like all right i'm just gonna make whatever and then grow past that do you think because you have such varied styles and and kind of jump around to different stuff do you feel like you have a very collector base meaning i'm sure there are people who are hardcore fans that collect anything and everything but do you feel that you have some splits where oh, there's yeah. some people who only like one thing and other people who are after the other and there's kind of pockets in your collector base for the different styles oh, yeah. definitely definitely for sure the, this, i have like a little toy called like uh you know like doji or they're more like the little small kind of yokai monster cute kind of style thing and yeah there's definitely people like they just want that and or there's people that want like the, the more grotesque stuff and they just want that are there's people that can appreciate both? So yeah, for sure. There's definitely different people that you know they just kind of jump in, jump out, or they want everything. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you said cute a couple different times. I want you to tell me what you think is the cutest thing you've ever made. I'm gonna look it up and see. <laughs> that that I ever made personally. That you th yeah for for of all the toys you've ever sculpted and made, what do you oh, think man. is the cutest toy to date? I want to look it up and see what I think of it. First, well, I, I think that the chibi stuff with Unbox is by far the cutest. But if something that I sculpted is going to be Bernie, for sure. He's uh, he's like a cross between hot stuff and gremlins. So Okay, Teresa, look that, it up and let's give us a number one to ten on the Teresa cute meter. How high does it rank? It's not going to be <laughs> number ten on her cute meter. I can for sure tell you that. I don't think one. so, but we'll see. Hold on. You know about Bernie, right? B E R N I E? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Mutant vinyl. I'm Googling Bernie Mutant yeah. Vinyl Hardcore. <laughs> he has big ears and bug eyes, man. It's like a Boston Terrier. <laughs> okay, so it's like this goblin guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, wait. Here, before I, before I comment, let me screenshot my results and make sure I'm looking at the right thing. So hold on. We put this in the Skype chat because I made the mistake. I, I mixed up Retroband's toys and I felt like an idiot. So let me That's make right. sure I don't screw this one up. Hold it on. Pasting it in. Okay. Just tell me this. Is it blank or is it painted? Oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah. It's blank. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's your cutest toy today. Mm. That, all right, listen, okay. listen, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that's the cutest thing that I sculpted. That doesn't mean I, I can't go cuter if I wanted to. That just happens to be the cutest thing I sculpted. I can appreciate the cutest thing down to, like, Hello Kitty. I just haven't gone that far into it yet. Sure. No, I, 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 I totally get that side of it. I'm still curious. Teresa, 1 to 10. 
on your That's scale in the style of cute that you collect, where does that rate on the cute scale? 10 being the, mm-hmm. the highest, mm-hmm. you would buy it at a 10, and 1 being no. Oh, God. Uh, well, I mean... Um... Go ahead. I... I, I know it's going to be like on the super low side, and that's totally okay. I'm not <laughs> yes, going to be offended at that's all. That's the fun of the show. Though. It does it's, have kind so of different. nice big eyes that you could paint like black, right, and keep it pretty simple. And it's kind of like it's it's a little chubby and like a little – yeah, I can see how it leans a little more cute. Um, um, this is a zero. Yeah, mental gymnastics. never go on your show. But, but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it definitely it, – it just makes me laugh a bit because – I like I looked at it, I googled it, and I was like, Are, "Is this it? Like, is this really supposed to be it? Is this cute?" It's but, a different yeah. cute. It's not Teresa <laughs> cute. It's just different cute. Is it it's George monster cute? cute? I see how it's cute in your world, but in my yeah. world, it's not cute. <laughs> oh, for sure. No, in your world, it's a, it's a monster for sure. No, I I I totally get it. I'd throw it at least a two. Give it a few <laughs> cute points. <laughs> All right. That's that's. Totally fair. I get it. Yeah. But yeah, it's. I do have to say though, I know that the two that you're working on with Unbox yeah. are leaning. Like I, I always love chibis, especially when they get kind of chubby. It's yes. like they, like you take a toy and squish it. So, but it's, it's kind of like you said, it's cute for your world. But in the grand scheme of like all of the scene, I wouldn't place those no, in. No. The side. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's a fair like fair assumption too. Like you can't you can't can't put it there, right? It's, you'd be you'd really be forcing that into like this cute category that doesn't exist for it. It's not meant to be there. So I get it. And it's, With the unboxed one you're cool. doing, the, the Chibi Super yeah. Deform series, the DX and Ollie, those yeah. are getting really close to what I would actually, I might actually pick one of those up if it's possible. I really yeah. really like those. So you're 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 now you're starting to like peel to me a little bit. You might not be reaching Teresa fully, <laughs> but you are starting to get into my world. Yeah, no, I, I heard the podcast and she was like, "Yeah, I don't think so." Yeah, no, I heard it. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's what I was going to ask because you are starting to kind of bridge that gap, like Gary said. You're starting to him be like, "Oh," so then like there's the people like me who are even far, far, yeah. even more left, right? Because we just I can't help it. I like what I like. But right, do right. you see, like, could you see yourself attempting to go further that way? Or is that too far for you? No, I mean, if if it's if it happens organically and it's meant to be, then I, then I sculpt it. But I'm not going to force it to try. I'm not going to, like, design something because I'm going for an audience, right? I'm going to make it because that's what I want to make. And if it just happens to fit that audience, then so be it. But it has to be something that I'm into and has to be something that I want to make. I'm this way I, I, I love it. I don't want to make it just to make it. I want to make it because I want to make it. You know, so if it if it happens to be if I happen to be sculpting something and it, and it goes that direction, great. Like right now, like, you know, for my daughter, I have this toy that I'm I'm making these little feral children and I'm gonna make a little girl head. So I'm gonna make that face as cute as I can get it. But it's gonna be on this little body that's kind of, you know, they have like a fur kind of upper part has like little booties and has little gloves but um for me that might be a, a more cuter side of things but it's only because i wanted to do that i'm not gonna definitely not gonna try to force it because then it wouldn't be it wouldn't be real and that's i think that's the yeah. thing where the collectors kind of they, they, they know like oh he's just looking for a cash grab or he's kind of trying to do something that's not in his lane you know yeah no i get it that makes sense now, Rich, you were talking earlier, and I think this is a, a point that you made that I think we kind of just glossed over real quick, but you were saying that you don't necessarily sketch and design these things out. You go straight no. to sculpt on a lot of parts. So how does that – when you go straight to sculpt, do you already have in your brain the scale that you're going to go for, or do you just kind of just go for it and whatever size they end up coming out to be is, just, is the size? I think that's it. I think it's whatever they come out to be is the size. If I was a smarter man, I would definitely try to like stay in lane this way, like all the other toys kind of fit with each other. But yeah, I think that's the thing when you kind of just grab the clay and start making things. Sometimes they work out and they all fit. Sometimes it's like, all right, well, now this is his own thing, and I can't make I can't make them kind of mash up with each other. Okay, yeah, so them- collectors shouldn't see like all of your pieces as like as in a one universe. They can be just different scales of different creatures yeah. and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. for sure. 
So do you ever see yourself, because I mean, you've, you've taught yourself sculpting, and I know everyone kind of seems to evolve, but do you see yourself staying in the world of Japanese pulled vinyl only? Do you want, have a desire to do any kind of molding or resins or other things outside of that, or is that the wheelhouse you want to stay in? You have done resins, though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I've never personally pulled it. Like, I have, you know, like, I work with Clutter, and they do my resin stuff, or uh, the guys from Box Squad, they do my resin stuff. That's what they do, and they do it well. And, you know, I, I'd rather stick to what I know and what I'm passionate about. Like, the resin stuff is, that, that requires a whole other skill set that I don't, I don't have the time to develop, but also I respect those guys immensely, so I'm going to let them do their thing and go to them for what I need to get done. And I'm just gonna stick in my lane because I, I I really love what I do. I love doing the sculpture work, and I love working with the Japanese vinyl, and that's just where my heart is at. It seems like you have a great working relationship with Clutter Studios. I, the one piece I saw, a two foot resin version, yeah. and it's almost it almost looks like a fiberglass sculpture. But to hear and yeah. read that it was resin, I was impressed. They can they, they're doing phenomenal quality over there. Yeah, no, like I like Josh Miranda, the guys that the whole team they have over there, they they they're they're class acts, man. Like I I've known them for the same probably thirteen years too. And did they, they specifically choose work. the Sludge Demon t- as a pay homage to your first figure, or did it, was that did you have any decision to that? Did they reach out to you to do the Sludge Demon, or how that it was come about? They reached out to me. Yeah, no, they reached out to me and like, you know, they they said, you know, they were like, what do you think about doing something like this? And I'm like, all right, let's, yeah, let's give it a shot. And then we're like, how about we do it this big? I was like, yeah, if you can do it. <laughs> Did you get one of those? Came, yeah, I have one for my shop. Nice. And then they came, they came to me with the prototype and I was like, oh my goodness. And that's, I, I have a photo on my Instagram somewhere of like, I have my daughter sending her, like I'm holding her in front of it because she was not even one years old. And it's just like the, this is just so funny how big this thing is compared to the baby. <laughs> so, so I've heard Unbox thrown out. You've collaborated with him, Clutter. You mentioned Medicom as well. What have you done with Medicom? Well, I um, I have like if he's my logo is that, that demon mask, and uh, I've been trying to work with Medicom for a long time, and when I finally got the green light to actually do something with them, it was just like I didn't want to continue to do what I'm already doing. Like I I I'm, I wanted to try to go outside of my boundaries. And that's why I was like, hi, I want to I want to do some kind of homage to, you know, like an American kind of character. And that's where Felix the cat. I was like, that would look kind of cool with this. And we kind of I kind of worked it up and I, I uh, proposed it to him and they were they were cool with it. So if you look at that, that figure, it's some of the, the vinyl collectible dolls line, kind of a high honor. And not too many American artists got to do that. You know, there's Pusshead and uh, this, you know, the name of a few. And I gave it a shot. And I think it came out really cool. It's just, but it's just totally different than what I'm actually making now. So that came through, and I think I'm going to revisit a smaller version of that in the future with the same guy that sculpted it, you know, and go from there. But yeah, it's 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 not like the the grotesque stuff, but it's it's definitely different than everything else I've ever done. Do you see yourself working with one of the larger companies to do a more mainstream? Like, would you work? Would you apply, say, a DX or an Ollie to a Bear Brick or a, a Dunny? Well, I, I don't, wa- I don't want to like speak out of what's coming in the future, but yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, there's definitely. Uh, I'll have. I'll be able to make an announcement next year, but yeah, I'm. I'm going to be continuing working with Metacom and uh, those guys. Uh, as far as like Dunnies, no, I haven't. I mean, it's not because I wouldn't. It's because I haven't been approached. But I don't. I don't know if that would really, you know, fall in line with what I'm doing, anyways. You know. I mean, I guess it would have to be some that would, you know, maybe uh, some kind of take one of the earlier customs I did. But, like, I, I just don't see them really fitting me. But yeah. as far as Metacom, as Metacom goes, yeah, I'm definitely going to continue working with them guys. It's just know. one of those things, you know, you're doing all this hand production, hand painted. Your stuff is extremely limited and, and it's probably spendy for a lot of your fan base. To have that yeah. one item that's maybe mass produced – Maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's not painted by yourself, but at least it's something mutant vinyl hardcore that someone out there can actually obtain and possess. Right. So it would be cool for you to do if someone was to you know want to work with you on that level. That'd be awesome. I think I mean like it's just time. I mean I'm gonna continue doing this because I enjoy doing it, and if if the opportunity comes up, you know we'll see. But I, I think it's just you know it's just time. I mean if, yeah. if the fan base is there and the fan base demands it, and then it, it will happen. If not, then it doesn't. I mean- I mean, you did. He did get um, a VAG series, Gary. So, 
um, his Ollie was in, uh, what was it, Series 16, I think? Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that to me is, is, I love VAG. It's one of my favorite kind of blind series that came up. It, I said VAG. I'm not I know. I, like that. That's <laughs> I, I, I caught that you said it, and I laughed as if you, what if you said it the real way that we normally say it, so... I mean, they couldn't have come up with a better name. I ain't going to lie. No, I mean, they it's couldn't. Still like a- I know. <laughs> and it's, oh I mean, no one's going to say vinyl artist gotcha. You're just going to say va- VAG. I say VAG. I know Gary likes to say badge like a weirdo. <laughs> It's not. That, you know, you, yeah, the acronym is not the. Greatest, it's an acronym. Like, yeah. When it's an acronym, you say the letters. You don't say just badge. But no, anyway, we, just, we disputed as before, and we proved that's not the case. Yeah. It's VAG. Anyway, just the fact that you've been able to do that. I mean, that I think is a cool way to get your name out there, and maybe we'll see other VAG from you of other characters and stuff. So it's cool that you're doing stuff like that, and and there'll be more like that through Unbox and whatnot. Uh, just different ways people to. Get, get their hands on your stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to again, just this, this. If it's if it's happening organically, is good. I, I just I just don't ever want to be that that guy that's trying to force something to happen because I'm like, oh, I think these collectors, I can capitalize on them. Like, I just want to make something that that's from the heart, and then hopefully it you know resonates with who it's supposed to resonate with. I just don't want to be hunting down these companies, but like, hey, man, we should make this, we should make that. I just want it to be it meant to be. Like I want, it, I want it to happen because it's just meant to happen, not because I'm trying to force it to happen. Right, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Can we can we talk about? There's a figure on your Instagram. I think it's called the Executioner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on? Tell us more about that thing because that figure, that sculpt looks amazing. Thanks. So killer. Yeah. No. I mean, um, so for when I opened up Dev's Vault, it was, you know, I. I that's again, like I, I was, I was sick and I, you know, like a couple of years after that and I, I was working from home and I, I was like, I, I need to get back to a studio again. So I went back to where I, you know, I had my first studio and I got, you know, the space and it was just, the space was just larger than I actually needed. And I was like, all right, either I'm going to make a little hang up for myself on one side or I can do something with it. And just like sitting down, I was like, no, it'd be kind of cool to have a little gallery. Right. I mean, like I, I, I was, wasn't, you know, I was still kind of sick at the time and I wasn't able to travel really much. I was like, well, maybe I could just bring people here. So after I got, you know, the space set up, I was like, all right, let's do a show. And I asked when Death Vault kind of started working. And I was just like, you know, over the next few years, I'm like, it'd be kind of cool to do like a, a mascot for the for the shop. And Death Vault is like an homage to like the, the Death Head DX. It's like his vault of toys. So it's Death's Vault. And like the when I when I did the uh, the logo for it, it was from, you know, EC Comics. And I was just like, you know, it'd be kind of cool if I had like a, a mascot that's kind of like a, a throwback to a horror comic mascot like the Crypt Keeper. And that's when like this executioner kind of character kind of came to be. I was like, that'd be pretty cool. So I hired Monster Sandbox to, to sculpt that for me because it was definitely in his wheelhouse. And I liked what he did with you know, a few other artists. I was like, I hate playing it. So he, I hired him to do that. And here we are. And it came out really, really cool. But it's just, it's, it's definitely more of like the line of, uh, like like a McFarlane-ish kind of toy meets Safubi. And, you know, I, I love the way it came out. And, you know, we'll see how the fans react to it. And if if it's good, I already have plans to continue on with other characters, getting that kind of, like, super kind of action figure kind of sculpt. But, yeah, man, that's where that kind of guy was born from. Yeah, it's definitely more of an action figure feel than a normal vinyl feel, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just, that, and again, it's just, like, the super, super detail that, you know, I, I, I was really into like I make him look like kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger meets, you know, like the like this this medieval. I didn't I just didn't want to have like a I didn't want to have a, an axe. I want to have some kind of sledgehammer where you can just, instead of like cutting heads, it just bashes heads. I, I, I wanted to be super brutal. <laughs> All know, right. So he's he's a logo for Death's Vault, right? Yeah. But he's got MVH on his back. Well, it kind of, it kinda, <laughs> well, it helps connect, right? On the on the bottom of the scope, though, it has the the Death Vault logo, so oh, okay. the very very bottom, yeah. Like you turn it over, it's this gigantic Death Vault destroyed logo. But like I wanted to connect, I want I, I want you know like to get people to to recognize who it was from. Like I, I, you got to throw a little bit on there that this to remind them that maybe a, a new collector doesn't really know. So if this putting the 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 MVA scar across his back. It's just enough of a connection where like they can be like, oh, what, what does this mean? And then they can look it up if they didn't know, and then they can see the connection, and then, oh, it all comes together. So it's just like, you know, you, you kind of throw a little bit of this into the next toy, and so the ne- toy after that won't need it. 
just that little bit of connection helps, you know, create the glue to keep it going forward. Nice. George, you're talking about the scar work of the MVH on the Executioner, but I'm looking at one, I think it's called the Fink, where MVH is sculpted in like a raised and boss treatment across the belly of the figure very prominently. It's, it's really cool. A lot of the times the signatures of the, of the artists and designers is like usually a foot stamp, and I like that you're implementing it on the main portion of the figure and also on sculpt. That's really cool. Well, thank you. Well, well that, I mean, this is again, it just comes down to like be getting bored and constantly like, well, we'll try this, we'll try that, right? So, it, it, it in, a, in a grand scheme of things, they all may look completely different, but the they all have that connection. They all work on a shelf together or in that world. Like I kind of look at it like Quentin Tarantino looks at all his movies. Like you have that, that you know, the the red apple cigarettes, and they all kind of it kind of travels across you know different genres and stuff, and it kind of all these little things kind of connect everything together, like the jujitsu fighters with the the ollie head. I mean, that's that connects it to the rest of the the the, the mutant vinyl hardcore toy world. So uh, all these little things that kind of connect things together is is the glue. But they don't necessarily have to be looking the same or same size and stature. Right. No, that's awesome. I mean, Teresa, you're asking why am I not doing this sort of stuff, and it's because one, my name sucks. So could you imagine Ham? written on every toy or a toy that just it doesn't sound nearly as good as looking at this awesome figure and seeing mvh like that means i, don't know, I think you could really play up the ham angle i think no. you could do it no it doesn't work like this I you think, it I works think it, you know you know the, the acronym for him is though right i mean so it could work what's the acronym for ham hard as a motherfucker <laughs> it's true <laughs> that's that me is that, that, that is me in a nutshell <laughs> that is Perfect. that is totally gary Wow. Gary's yeah. ham on everything. Dude, Go I, no, damn. What? that's badass. I you like could that. Do a, see? You could do, <laughs> I could see you, Gary, if you tried to delve into this world, not that you would, but like you could play with a ham bone and like all of your characters have some like bone popping out of it that looks like a ham bone. And that would be your own Yeah, all right. That too. I would like everyone to address me in the future as hard as a motherfucker ham. Or Gary. That's it. See, you just did it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rich, when we, were, when we were talking about getting you on the show, I, I admittedly, like, I don't know that much about you, and I, I don't know how that's possible, because reputation-wise, I know you're the shit. You're one of the biggest names in our toy scene. But, the sa- but at the same time, you you mentioned that you're underground, and that you like to be deep underground and all that sort of stuff. So what does being underground in this toy scene mean to you? Uh, I mean, I think it's... I, I, I think it kind of boils down to like I'm not really concerned with being the guy that's in the the you know in the spotlight all the time or you know I, I think it's just I'm more focused on the actual art and toy side of things in my fan base and that kind of you know I'm staying with Sofubi that it's very limited to how many you can make and you can you kind of stuck in this this area where you're kind of going to be on, on the small scale of things it's not like Cause where he can make you know a run of thousand figures, you know, that's, that becomes a big mainstream, but like being like, like in this style of toy design, is going to be more underground. It's going to be, you know, for that kind of collector. I mean, I'm not making toys that are like generally accepted by everybody. So I'm kind of making like what I want. Sometimes that's grotesque and that's not for everybody. So that kind of is going to stay like in that kind of underground scene to me. At least. Right. And I think for myself, the reason maybe I don't see a lot of your work all the time because I primarily go to our two sponsors, the Toy Chronicle and Spanky Stokes. I'll do a social media scroll and whatnot, but I know a lot of your work you you I you would probably see on like Kaiju Corner and and you mentioned school brain forms and stuff like that. And I just never really ventured in, into those areas. Well, I mean it's it's out there. I mean, but it's it's, it's again, I mean, it's just how much can one person look at in a day? I mean, there's just so many yeah, different styles of toys. I mean, like, even if you wanted to, like, try to cover your bases for everything, it's impossible. So I think people kind of just say, "All right, this is what my 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 lane is," and they kind of they go there. And sometimes they'll find a toy that kind of goes out of their lane, and they'll go down that path. But for the most part, they'll find something that they're just really into, and that's it. And this, what I make, is kind of in that that lane where it's kind of more underground toys. And I'm very happy there. I'm very comfortable there. And you know, I I think the fan base is just incredible they're they're very supportive they're very you know they're very passionate they they want to keep their kind of like 
toy scene pure and they want to police it. They want to make sure everything is good. It's not, it's very personal. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like it. That's why I'm able to talk to my fans like one on one. I've become really good fan, you know, friends with some of my fans because of this. It's not, it's not, I'm not faceless, you know? So these are the, the positives that come with being what I consider like an underground kind of toy designer maker. Yeah, it makes total sense. I know when I would go out to like San Diego Comic Con, a lot of like, um, you know, there'd be the mainstream stuff inside the convention hall. But if you wanted yeah. to see the, you know, the Safubi and the Kaiju, you would have to go to a show at Gunzo or many years you ago, to- you would go to Super 7 and, you know, and see stuff there. So it's like, so it is a little bit, it wasn't like in your face at like the stuff that you would see conventions. Every once yeah. in a while you would see some stuff, but, but that's. Know, that's, that's it with everything. You want to see the real cool shit? You got to go up the beaten path a little bit, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> that's where all the cool shit really is all the time. Yeah. Music well, or movies. It, I mean, but I think part of it too, and it's, I, I pray this doesn't come across disrespectfully, but <laughs> for, I think people like us who aren't ingrained in that part of the scene, mm-hmm. when I see so Fubi news, it's very hard for me to know who's behind it because a lot of it for me looks the same sure. which I, I, again i'm not tr- i'm trying so hard to make this not sound bad but <laughs> but you know as someone who's who likes cute right when i see a yeah. lot of the sofubi a yeah. lot of it it's kind of a blended thing for me no, and i don't totally. i can't you know i can't look at it and go oh that's a mutant vinyl hardcore versus a retro brand versus a paul kaiju i can't right. do that because i just don't have that's just not something i'm ingrained in whereas vice versa i'm vice versa i'm sure someone in that realm looks over at what I collect and is just like, they see the same old big eye smiley yeah. face stuff. Right. And right, so right. that's why, that's why I've always had such a hard time understanding the Sofubi side of the scene because it all kind of blends together. And I have a hard time understanding the, the differences between styles and artists and all that, because it's just not something I'm passionate about. That's exactly it, though, right? I mean, like, if it was something that you were really into, you would, you know, you would just automatically, by osmosis, start finding all the names or anything. But it's because you're not, you're just not. Like, just, you know, same thing with me. Like, I'm not going to go, you know, like, I'm not drawn to the super duper Q stuff. So I'm not, like, finding all the names. And I'm not, I, same thing with me. It all kind of looks the same. So, I mean, yeah. I, I don't think, I think that, I don't think that's disrespectful at all. I think that's just, like, how much can you, you know, can you do? And if that's what you're drawn to, that's where your energy is going to be focused. And yeah, also, I mean, all... you're definitely not going to insult me, by the way. <laughs> like, it takes a lot to insult me, so don't 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 worry about it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we all we all find our own pockets, and some right. of us have wider wider scope and and things that we like. I mean, I always joke like I feel like I narrowed scope into cute, but that doesn't mean that truly really narrowed me at all. But we yeah. all find our pockets, and so it's yeah. just. I, it's it's always fun for me to have guests like you on because it is a whole new world for me, and I like kind of learning it and and kind of being educated and understanding a bit more. But I think that's kind of where we're at, Gary. We we it's out there. The news is out there. It's just not something we ingrain ourselves in. So it's just it ends up being this kind of mystery box that side right. of the scene. I mean, like I I've worked with like you know Brant Peters and those guys, and like I I I've, I've seen the the Q side of that, and like I, I I get it, man. Like you can only go so far. I mean, like, what can you do? I mean, you just, you, you can't collect everything and be on the know about everything. It's just impossible. I have a dream. Here's what I would like to happen. I would love it. I would love it if Teresa would open up a gallery next door to Death Vault. And on the same night, you can, like, one side is, like, Teresa's sort of thing. And then the other side, and you guys can just intermingle. I think that'd be perfect. I mean, you gotta have this like this, you know, salty and sugary. You know, you gotta have a little the the you know yin and yang. It, it, it works. It'd be amazing. It'd <laughs> be kind of fun. Teresa would be I complaining always... about how there's no you know there's no colorful shirts available. It'd be a whole thing. <laughs> no black shirts in my shop. <laughs> None. A lot of tie dye stuff. Pink. Maybe pinks, <laughs> purples. I don't know. I don't. I don't discriminate from color. I just don't Maybe like they're... anti. I, I love pinks and purples and blues and stuff like that too. And I I I buy the occasional non-colored. Well, <laughs> no, that's good. That's I, was like, I was like, I, know. I actually I do have I do have a few like black, gray, white stuff, but it's mostly colorful. 
But yeah, that'd be fun. I actually always thought it'd be funny to like set up um, at like Ultra Pop. I don't know if you're familiar with Ultra Pop. It's but it yeah. leans uh, it leans less cute. But I always yeah. thought it'd be funny if you could dedicate a corner to me, and I'd call it the cute corner, and I would just like, stuff it full with just like cute galore. So it'd be fun. Maybe you could have like a cute corner in Death Vault. So just like a little corner of the shop is like the opposite of everything else around it. I could definitely test that out. That'd be, be fun. <laughs> It'd be like a little like pink sparkly haven in the corner, and like little kids can run to it. So like their dad can be over there looking at like creepy McCreepster, and then you could be like, "But look over there! It's like a really cute unicorn. Go check this that." Has, out. This has taken. <laughs> yeah, where turn. has this shop gone? <laughs> I feel like we barely scratched the, the the surface of your of the world of mutant vinyl hardcore. I don't know how to get it back on track. Because <laughs> there's so much, it's um... yeah. I mean, like, how are you gonna have a like? I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so it's hard to like have a single conversation and try to, you know, talk about everything. I mean, that's just impossible. But so far, this has been great. I mean, I really appreciate all the questions and like even well, like the. the how about we just go? To, let's go to some listener questions and then see if where where this takes us. Oh boy, uh, I have I have one before we go to that. Maybe it is, it, maybe it's even a listener question. I don't know, but what do you collect? Like now that you're a toy maker, yeah, uh, and most of your money probably goes to making toys. What do you collect still? Oh man, I, I'm still an active collector. I'm I'm always buying toys. I don't I really don't have like anything specific. Like you know this I'm, I I was literally just looking at the cause release the other day, and you know so you know, for for that uh, I I just bought a couple plushies. I mean like a friend of mine was selling some uh, a cause and a Murakami plushie, so I bought those for me and my kids. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, and I, another friend of mine was selling a Beemon, so I just bought one of them. Like, I'm always buying toys. Like, it just never stops. Any mass market stuff or just in our world of designer stuff? Uh, every now and then I'll see like a Funko Pop that, like, like I like. I mean, I like a lot of the Joker stuff that, that cracks me up, so I bought a bunch of that. But, um, I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, biased. If, if, if I come across something, if I, if I take, that's, that's the bummer about, like, not having Toys R Us anymore. Like, to be able to take my kid there and buy him toys and buy myself some toys. So it would be, you know, I, I, I'm not, like, you know, looking for anything specific. It's just that, like, if something comes across that's, you know, that catches my eye. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to buy that. <laughs> I can't help myself. You sound kind of like myself in the regards. Like, I don't collect any one thing or any one person. Yeah. I just pick up the things that in the moment appeal to me that I want to own it at that moment. And that's when I make my purchase. Yeah. I, mean, no questions I think asked. I'm a hoarder. <laughs> so hey, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> I think we all are. Yeah. <laughs> that's the collector mindset. Me okay, we have a listener question that kind of follows up to this. Who do you collect? I think, I think for me, it's always going to be Beamon. I mean, that's I mean, that's the one toy maker that will always be the king to me. I mean, that between like uh, sculpts and especially paint, it has changed my whole thought process of hmm. what a toy can be. That's always going to be the go-to. Unfortunately, he doesn't make a lot, so it's and it's very hard to get, <laughs> even as even by like Japanese toy standards go, it's like impossible half the time. You gotta like get it on the secondhand market all the time. Damn. Yeah. All right, sorry, I'm a noob. Is Beamon a toy? Like a name of a toy by an artist? Beamon is a brand name. Uh, Honda is the artist, which nobody really knows. <laughs> Uh, Beamon's the brand, the, the pollution monster is the Kogai, then he has like the two-headed monster, then there's like the space monster, and the one looks like Loctis monster, he has a, he has a bunch of toys, but Beamon is the brand, or uh, Soft Final Hardcore, which is another homage from my name to that guy. I, I mean, like, I'm... I think even with myself, there's a lot of like, a lot of homages to other toy brands that you know, is there like even like my gallery? I I I, I was an homage to Bonnie Hunter by saying all other galleries suck because their cash line was all other toys suck. Nice. I'm I'm gonna take a picture and just make sure I even know what I'm. If this is it, this is where this is where I get becomes like such a such a freaking noob. It's okay. It's Gary, you don't know what he's talking about. You can't. I have no clue what he's talking about. But I, but, okay. but that's also the part like of the show it. and the, like yeah. where people like kind of get on us because this toy yeah. scene is so 
hard to talk on and cover every aspect of it and talk on it intelligently and not sound like a total noob. And that's why for so long, Teresa, you and I just, we kind of talked about what we know. You're right, Gary, because literally that I I said like, okay, I don't know Boomon. And then you went in a spiel to explain it to me. And literally at the end of your spiel, I just had more questions than answers. <laughs> Cause I was like, I don't recognize that name or that name. Or that name. Yeah, don't or feel that too name. bad. Don't feel too bad because like I'm I'm still feeling stupid half the time. I'm like I think I pronounced that wrong or yeah I don't know anything about that and I've been collecting this guy for like ten years and I don't know anything about this. So it's just, you're just, just definitely not you. But is that did I find the one of them? Yeah. In did, the that, picture that, I sent. Yeah. Okay. And, and I made a, a pollution monster last year. That's an homage to that pollution monster. <laughs> yeah. so you do have an inspiration sometimes it's inspired by other people's stuff oh for sure i mean like i, I it's just it's just the way it works I, I mean like not everything i'm doing is like this complete brand new idea half time is just like man it'd be cool to make one of those my like my own like you know so like that particular toy it was like a it was a photo of that on the you know the ikb uh smog on header but the toy was never made so there was no there was no official toy, and Beamon was the one that kind of made that toy. But there was no official toy of that, so it was kind of like an open market for it. Meg, I mean, it was, there really was no licenses on it, so it's his toy, but it's not his design either. It was from a header. He didn't come up with that originally, and most of his other toys were the same exact way. Like the two-headed monster was a photo from uh, Famous Monsters uh, magazine. He didn't come up with that idea. I mean, like so. Uh, even like with like Hirota, like all like not all, but the majority of his toys are from other you know like maybe like garage model kits or whatever. So it's it's just like the the reinterpretation of a lot of things, you know. So it's, it's, and there's definitely like original ideas, but they're all mixed in with homages or like you know reinterpretations of other toys. It happens all the time. Wow. See, I had no idea. These I thought these were a lot of these were original toys. I didn't know that they were based on something or homages to things i, th- I oh, think no, go for it. yeah i think that's what like really you know the keeps people you know moving along they see something that was from their past or something that they're you know they're familiar with and it's like oh yeah yeah i, I remember that and it kind of creates one more connection you know that's why like even with some of my toys that uh, with like the berserker like the mask on that is from lord humongous from you know from mad max so it's just like oh, these little okay. These little things kind of like just like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that little piece. It's just taking a little of this, a little of that, mixing it together and putting your own little spin on it. And that's kind of like a lot of like Japanese design or patchy kind of toy designs. So it's like Easter eggs. Do you disclose your Easter eggs or do you just kind of leave them in there as like if someone recognizes it, awesome, but some may not and just like the figure as itself? Like, do you like it when it's more of an Easter egg like that Mad Max? Mad Max mask? (laughs) <laughs> um there's a talk to us here. yeah right no I, I i don't yeah i i i'm pretty open with everything like i'm not i don't hide anything but you know i'll put that out there and then a new collector will come along and you know long after i might have put that out there and so they don't really know and they don't know why they like it but they just like it because of, they don't know okay yeah. so let's move on to some listener questions let's see if uh your fan base ask you some tough questions <laughs> okay I'm not going to try. Well, I don't even actually mention his name. Eugil would like to know why they never win an MVH masterpiece for their collection. Well, because them and a lot of other people are trying to do the same exact thing. I'm, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Easy. I, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I, I mean, like again, I, I try. I mean, that's why, like, I'll do my best to have lotteries or do shop drops or do larger open runs or blanks. I do all these things to try to make people happy. But at the end of the day, I can only do so much. And some people are going to be mad or some people are not going to win this time. But I try. And if I find out that somebody's been trying to buy some for, like, years and never got, I'll make sure that they get something at some point. I mean, like, I I have a list of people that I'm like, all right, yeah, you haven't won anything in six years that's kind of shady so let me try to figure something out for you dude that's crazy i'm glad yeah. i, I'm glad I don't collect you it sounds really hard <laughs> and frustrating well thanks no for offense, the, uh, but... you know, the... <laughs> no no <laughs> no offense well no it's... he's probably <laughs> that's a compliment he's, pro- yeah. he's probably one of those booths like we know when we walk into certain shows there's always this like 
line of people ahead of you, and I always know there's so few people, and you're probably one of those booths that people run to immediately and line up, and then your booth's emptied, and then it's just like you go hang out for the rest of the con. Yep. Pretty much. I mean, like, like I, I know you guys were at <laughs> Five Points, but I had a tent set up at Five Points way in the back. <laughs> just no right on Saturday. Yeah. Speaking of, are you going to Designer Con? Oh, no, not this year. Not I mean, my... Year. Yeah, because I'm, I mean, we're I'm not literally like my, my wife is having our third next week. <laughs> oh, and uh, yeah, so like two days before my show and my gallery. So it's going to be madness. And then after that, I'm going to spend some time with my family this year. So I'm not going to be able to make it out there. That's understandable. You know, Ms. Muju yeah. turned down having her baby on our show. Any chance that your wife would like to you know, have the baby on the show? We can record that. Oh, that be uh, a new for, for things, but. <laughs> I'm gonna make I'll, it happen. Bring, At some point, someone's gonna deliver a baby on this show. I'll bring my Gary. I'll bring my phone into the recorder room. I'll record it and I'll send it over to <laughs> there you. you. Go, thanks. Put it in post. Oh my gosh! Uh, your upcoming collaboration with Punk uh, Punk Drunkers. How did that come about? I've been a fan for them for forever, and it's just they're just so unique. And then uh, I happen to you know work with uh, Keith from the incredible store in Hong Kong and he's friends with them. And I just simply asked, like, I've been a big fan. This is, you know, I've been collecting you guys for a long time. Would you ever be interested in doing something? You know, I had to prove myself. I had to prove, you know, like what, you know, my concept and all that. And he agreed. So it was just, it was just, I think it's just, you know, they see that, you know, I'm looking to work with them because of how much I respect them. And how much I actually follow them. So I mean, it just worked out from you know a fan level and from an artist level. Yep. Isn't that great when you finally get to a, a point in your career where you've established yourself, you've proven yourself and your quality and your reputation that you can finally reach out to people that you respect and they're familiar with your work enough to want oh. to work with you? It's the best. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, I still like I I. I I mean, I, I, I get starstruck all the time by these makers, and uh, I'm half the time if they say, yeah, I know you, I'm like, there's no possible way you know who I am. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I appreciate it. It's line. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's such a Very good feeling. Amazing. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. Like, when I got to meet Maury for the first time of Real Head, I literally got tongue-tied, didn't know what to say to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so are you guys on a good relationship now versus when you first oh, yeah. started out? And, and all oh, that? yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sure. When are we gonna are we gonna see more collaborations with Real Hud? Um, that I don't know. It, it really depends on Maury. That guy's a super busy guy. I mean, he's he, he's one of the harder working toy makers of all time. So you know, if if he would allow it, I would be honored. But if he doesn't, I'm very happy with what I got. This to work with him that one time, you know, is, is still incredible. It's still one of those highlights of my career. Wow. Now you mentioned that your was it second was it your third child was on the my, way next week? My third. That's okay. So that's yeah. insane. And plus, you have the show that next weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how are you balancing your work life and your home life? Is it is it easy for you or, or is it a struggle? Very delicately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Mad I mean, respect. like, I'm, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm very blessed to be able to do this full time, right? So I mean, like, just that alone allows me to do many different things like if i had to work a full-time job and try to do this it'd be it'd be so hard but since i'm a full-time you know artist i'm able to you know set a schedule where like all right i can you know, get up in the morning time spend some time with my kids before they go to school hang out with my wife talk about things and maybe go to jujitsu then go to my my uh my studio and then it's just constantly working and then you know by the time my kids are getting out of school i'm coming home for my day and i can spend time with them and then just it is you're just constantly trying to juggle the time and then you know i'm always talking to my wife about you know what, what she needs and what can i do to help and just being in tune with each other very cool now i was intimidated just by your reputation your name your body of work now i find out you're a jujitsu master <laughs> like what the hell you're like a I'm, american I'm, badass I'm, I'm very hard mm. <laughs> is, your, um, is, your, is your is your studio out of your out of the desk vault as well. So do you leave the home and do all your work at the studio? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, 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 um, when I first went full time, I was, we had a condo and I was doing it out of the basement, but it was this, you know, after like two years of waking up, going to work literally in your house and like never leaving, like mm -hmm. I, I went crazy. I, I literally had to get out of there. So yeah. So now I have 
my studio, which is back in, in New Haven, back in my, my you know, the Fairhaven area. And I get to, you know, I, I go there, I do my work. When I'm done with that day, I can just shut it down and come home. Now, you know, in my, my home now, I'm going to set up a new studio just to have for the wintertime. And especially since we have, you know, the new one coming, I want to be able to work from home if I need to. Yeah. But having that separation is, is, is needed for sure. For sanity. Oh, for sanity, for sure, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other listeners questions? Because we could do a few lightning questions. No, that was it for the listener questions. That was easy. You guys, you guys lucked out. I know. <laughs> I, I was I expecting the hard hitting stuff, but nope. Can uh, I just can I, can I say, Gary? I know in your like little <clears throat> hey, we're gonna have MBH on. You said you called him polarizing, and the whole time I thought, okay, he's gonna come on and like spitball these like views that like are going to be so controversial and you're like the nicest person ever why the heck are you would people think you're polarizing i've been around for a long time right so like either you like me or you don't like me and that's very very clear and like yeah like i i i've have plenty of people that don't like me and the people that don't like me are very vocal about it <laughs> so i mean it just happens, man. Like people come up with their own opinion on things or they, you know, they assume things and they assume them wrong or a lot of times, especially because of like the internet age, man, they don't get to know you and they just assume that, that you're doing this and they're, you're out to get them intentionally. And so it kind of creates a rift. And sometimes those people get together. <laughs> and sometimes those people start a little movement within themselves and then they have your, you know, polarization there. But I mean, it's, Yeah. See, I use the term as I know sometimes to some people, it all depends what polarizing means to people. I know there's a, a hard definition of it, but when I hear you know, polarizing, to me, it's it's a, it's a positive thing. It means that you know what you want, you know what you're after, you're not trying to appeal to the masses, you're not saying everything is amazing, everything is great. Like You're willing to have a viewpoint, an opinion, and be yourself. And to me, that's what it means when I say you're a polarizing right. figure. Yeah, but that also can create problems with people when you're not agreeing to what they want to hear or, you know, not giving in to agreeing with them just because they're saying it, right. you know? No, I totally get that, but I respect you for standing by your, your opinion because people should have opinions. We're all different. We shouldn't all be expected to be the same. Um, but I would love to talk on that more, but we need to move on to – you want to do a round of uh, lightning questions, Teresa? Yeah, I, I, I opened your prep. Doc Gary, so I was gonna spit a few out. Okay, how about it? Okay, Rich, if you could only produce one color or special treatment of Sofubi for the remainder of your career, what would you choose? Red. That was fast. That was fast. Okay. <laughs> I like that was it. That's awesome. That was the quickest answer ever. I like it. You, you're doing a lightning round the way they should be done. Okay, you talk a lot about um, you know struggling to make enough toys for everyone. If you had, didn't have any limitations and can produce however much you want, however quickly you want, and still keep the quality, okay. would you produce a heck of a lot more? Yeah, for sure. Because, uh, okay. I mean, like, I, my, my goal is to make people happy. I ain't trying to make people, like, pissed off for no reason, you know? So, like, yeah, if I could, yeah, that would be the answer. Sure. The man's got three kids, Teresa. College <laughs> ain't cheap. Mass produce. Got a, a lot of mouths to feed, man. <laughs> What is your Holy Grail toy in your collection? Or have you ob obtained your Holy Grail toy? Boy. I've obtained my Holy Grail toy. But that's the thing, man. Like, you know, my Holy Grail was always like a one-off, you know, a Beamon, like a cool guy. Okay. I have one. But he's made probably like a hundred of them. So I've seen multiple of them and I'm like, oh my God, I would love to own that one. But, uh, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> so I, I would say I have my, my grill. It's been a long time since I've looked at this list of lightning around questions I have. And this one, I can't believe I even, it's a horrible question because it's, <laughs> it's, it's just not a lightning crown question. I don't like, I'm just going to say what it is. You do not have to answer this. This is a heavy one. What's your biggest accomplishment and your greatest failure? Oh my God. <laughs> Gary, see, that see, is that's, such a that's, shit that's interview a shit, question. That is a shit interview question. That's going back to probably season one, episode two, or something. That's a well, that's tell insane. me about tell me about your emotional attachment to toys. <laughs> tell me oh, about come on, man. That's not a terrible question at all. I think it's decent. I mean, it's I, all I right, think, but like, it's my heavy. biggest accomplishment is actually getting a toy made in Japan at a Japanese factory at a time when there was nobody able to do that. I think mean, okay. it's like for the time. 
it happened was like you know it, it was literally almost impossible that's true so, yeah i mean like i connected with the one guy that was from the united states at the one factory in japan that I took my work on like there was no other factors that would have done that and i just happened to know him through skull brains so if i wasn't on skull brain i would have never have met him and it was never would have happened and i would have never be here right now it's true and it, the whole, go, Gary. I mean, the it whole, was a good it is a good question and then also really like the whole relationship building in this in this industry a lot of people yeah. like to hopscotch around the different producers and different makers and and i think like what you do rich is it's so important you build the relationships and you honor that relationship and you're patient with that person like i know working in japan is not easy and you have to be patient and work with that mom and pop system and pulling 50 or 100 or whatever your pieces and that's and that's a detriment to you know the the quality of work that you do as well that you're building those relationships to be able to make the product that you make Gary use the wrong word it's not Did detriment. I say detriment I know yeah I'm it's a, it, I can't even think of the right <laughs> word now but like, that is the opposite that is the opposite of what you mean but you know what I'm going for my IQ is not going. high what's your greatest <laughs> failure Ooh, my greatest failure Jesus Christ. Oh man, that's a that's a tough, tough question. Trick question. He's never failed. <laughs> <laughs> um man, biggest failure. How am I gonna how do I answer that question? Like I I, I would say probably like just disappointing fans. I mean I mean as, as in, in this art career, I mean that's okay. that, that's a hard one to swallow half the time, like getting emails from people like just gutted. I'm like that sucks. If you can go back in time, what advice would you give yourself now? Don't think too much. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like that's the, that's the biggest thing, man. Like half the time, like you can destroy an idea just by overthinking it and this, you know, like diluting it instead of just doing it. Stop thinking about what people will think. Stop thinking about what people are going to say or comparing you or having their gripes or whatever. Just do it. Do what makes you happy. You don't care what people are going to say. They're going to say it no matter what. So just do it. Nice. Yeah. Would you ever I mean, uh, do a license piece? Yeah. What, I mean, what license would you choose to, to do? If I can do a license piece. Yeah. I, I, I would, man, that, that, see, like, that's, that's a question, like, it's impossible to answer so fast. I would have to really think about that. Would, <laughs> it most likely would be some kind of, uh, some kind of, movie uh franchise that's not so famous <laughs> that's more what i'm into okay but yeah i mean don't i i've, I've talked would it be to safe to say that's probably going to be something sci-fi horror based maybe or most likely yeah i've talked to brian flynn a few times about like seeing because he'll get up with some uh licensing and that hasn't happened yet <laughs> but okay. I, I haven't not for not trying all right last hardest hitting question this is our hardest hitting lightning round question What's your favorite Patrick Swayze film? Patrick Swayze film, Roadhouse. Damn right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I waited. One day maybe someone will say Ghost. That's never no one's going to say Ghost. Podcast. Yeah, not <laughs> when Roadhouse a great one. No, it's always, round, it's always Roadhouse or The Outsiders. It's, it's the, those are the two answers. <sighs> not not for break. me. Hmm. Nobody said Point Break? No, I don't think so. Don't think so. But I'm changing mine to Point Break because I gotta be the I gotta be that guy. <laughs> there you go, well, Rich. I'm sorry. Hey, Gary, we, we I had a can blast. I throw in one one more one yeah, really yeah, yeah. really quick. Sure. Okay, you talked a lot about collaborations. Uh, if you could collaborate with anyone, what would be a dream collaboration that you haven't done yet? Cause, crazy. Cause. Damn. Yeah, cause. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I, I I mean, I've had this conversation with my wife a bunch of times, and just like how that guy has become you know, what he's become. He's the apex of like toy design. I mean, like he's, he's done it. That's like, cause that's, oh. I, I think that's just so unattainable. I mean, like, why not? You know? Sure. Why not? Give us. Hey, no. you never know. Yeah. Maybe. Rich, this, I, I do not want this to end. I've had a pleasure talking with you. It, um, I know we've barely scratched the surface with you, but we are up against the clock, so we do have to start wrapping it up. But if you would have us, I would love to talk for with you again another time. Come back on. Um, yeah, 
Uh, hopefully, we've introduced you to some, some new people out there, and hopefully your fan base, they're probably disappointed that we didn't go further into your career and all that sort of stuff, but uh, yeah. we'll save that for another time. But otherwise, I want to wish you best of luck on the birth of your child next week, as well as the show you have on the weekend. Man, you got a crazy weekend ahead. Uh, so best of luck on all of that. Yeah. But for now, why don't you take a brief moment and just let our listeners know where they can find you and all that good stuff. I am at Mutant Vinyl Hardcore on Instagram. Also, Death's Vault on Instagram. Uh, same name on Twitter. Uh, I did have a Facebook page, and I might still exist, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, MutantVinylHardcore.com everywhere. Like that's that's the handle. So Google that. You'll find me everywhere. Awesome. Thanks again. It was a pleasure. Well, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you, guys. Teresa, where can people find you? Want to find me? Check me out on Instagram, tmhawk24. George. I'm also on Instagram at Double G Toys. And I'm Gary Ham on Instagram and superham.com. This has been the Marsham Two Eye Toy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Marsham Toy Hour. We do this every week, not because we have to, but because Gary makes us. <laughs> so until hmm. our next transmission, we're signing off. Bye. Bye. Man, I, I I know there's so much more we can talk I, to you about. I know, and I was we forgot about sponsors though. Did you want me to do a quick sponsor spiel for you, Gary? Sure. Okay. <laughs> if you want some, uh, shoot. Do does do our sponsors sell mutant Mut- vinyl hardcore? Nope. No, everything sells <laughs> out. No one gets their hands All right, on that so stuff. You may not be able to buy mutant vinyl hardcore goodies, but if you want other stuff, you can buy from three awesome sponsors: Three Retro, Strange Cat, My Plastic Heart. Uh, there's some codes out there. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but we'll post them or something. You can find them. And if you want to find news about mutant vinyl, mutant vinyl hardcore or other awesome stuff, so food be cute, whatever, check out Toy Chronicle and Spanky Stokes. That's our sponsors. <laughs> okay, nice. Okay. I'll cut that in. All right, guys. Well, I told my wife I would be done by 8.30. So. You can look at that. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's my turn to, to wrangle those monsters out there. All right, guys, thanks for having right. me. I mean, I, 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 I'd love to do this again if you have not Yeah, definitely. We'd love to have you back. It was great talking yeah, to you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. That, that was fun. I, I, yeah, that was good. That was good. All right, man. We'll uh, All right. give me a show. If you want to you know, drop me a line, if you want to do it again, we'll free. We'll do it again. All right, sounds good. All right, everybody. All right, guys. Have a good night. Take care, everybody. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.